It's the Cube covering Sapphire Now 2017. Brought to you by SAP Cloud Platform and HANA Enterprise Cloud. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with the Cube with our ongoing con uh, coverage of SAP Sapphire 2017 out down in Orlando. Uh, really exciting day today, day two, because we got to see Hassel Plotner. Uh, got up and gave his keynote, Jordan, uh, joined by George Gilbert. George, great to see you. I know you've known Hasso for years and years and years. So, f impressions of the keynote. God, there's so much stuff that we can dig into and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Hasso almost never disappoints because um, he's just got a, a richness of history and a vision. He goes all the way back to the beginning. He, he was probably the sort of the technical visionary um, from the very beginning, he was the guy who took them uh, from the first super integrated mainframe um, ERP package all the way to the client server age with R3 and now beyond into sort of um, in memory, um, cloud ready, and with machine learning and IoT, you know, baked in. But he really speaks like a developer. You can really tell that he yeah. he likes the technology, he understands the technology, he's kind of a no BS guy. Um, some of the Q&A afterwards, you know, people were trying to trip him up and challenging him on stuff, and he would either say, I don't, you know, I don't know, or I don't believe that, or you know, here's our impression. Uh, really, you could tell he's a humble guy, smart guy, and really has a grasp of what the heck is going on here. Yeah. So let's d jump into it. So many themes we can talk about, um, but the one that started out early in the conversation was he literally said, we need to get as quickly to the cloud as possible. Here's this coming from a guy who built the company based on, you know, on-prem, ERP, heavy lifting, and even he said, today, 2017, we need to yeah. get to the cloud as quickly as possible. I think there are a few things going on behind there, if, you know, when you unpack it. One is, um, they did start building for the cloud in the early 2000s, and it was meant to be uh, a product for the mid-market. In fact, actually, it's first objective wasn't to be cloud ready, it was for, the first objective was to be highly configurable so that you could bend it to the needs of many customers without customizing it because typically with the customizations, it made it very difficult to upgrade. Um, and in, in making it configurable first and, and sort of cloud ready second, um, they kind of accomplished neither um, but they learned a lot. And so they started on uh, sort of this next version, which was, okay, we're going to take an in-memory database, which we're building from the ground up because Oracle wasn't building it at the time. Um, and then we're going to build SAP, sort of the ERP from scratch on top of this new database because database was so high performance that they didn't have to separate analytics from transactions the way traditionally you do in all you you had to do in all applications so they could simplify the app then in simplifying it they could make it easier to run in the cloud and now just like Oracle just like Microsoft um, they now build cloud first and on-prem second because by building in cloud first it sort of a uh, sort of simplifies the assumptions that you have to make. Right, and he talked quite a bit about that so much effort now is around the integration connectors um, to get stuff in and out of this thing, and, that, and that's a big focus. He said it's not that we're ignoring it, it's just a big, hard, hairy problem that we're attacking. Yeah, and, and this is interesting because, and there's a lot of history behind this. Oracle in the 90s, um, up, until, up until about the late 90s, their greatest success was in their industry-specific applications where they took different modules from different vendors and stitched them together. And that was how they built like a special solution for consumer packaged goods companies. But it turned out that you, that, that wasn't really workable because the different modules from the different, for the different vendors sort of upgraded at different rates, so there was no way coherently to integrate them and tie them together. And SAP had said that all along. They were like, this wasn't going to work. So fast forward to the last five plus years, SAP started buying um, products from a bunch of different vendors, Ariba, SuccessFactors, Concur, Hybris. And so you're like, aren't they doing the same thing Oracle did, you know, 
10 years, 15 years before. But no, and this is what Hasa was talking about today, which was once those apps are in the cloud, you only have to build the integration points uh, once. It's not like when it's on every customer's you know, data center, you have to build integrations that work for every version that every customer has. And so I think that's what he was talking about. You put it all in the cloud, you integrate it once. Another thing that he talked about, I, he, he really, he spoke in tweets. If anyone goes to my Twitter uh, feed, I was basically like bang, 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 and as he was talking. So he talked about databases, and yeah. databases in the cloud. Nobody cares, right? It's a classic thing we hear over and over. We presume it works, we just want it to work. You know, it, it should just work. And, Nobody and really cares what the underlying database is. But he cloud. was, in those cases, referring to these purchased apps, Concur, SuccessFactors, Ariba, Hybris. He was like, some of them work on SQL Server, some of them work on Oracle, but you know what? Until we get around to upgrading them to HANA, it doesn't matter, because you, the customer, don't know that. If they were on-prem, and you had to support all those different databases, it might be a different story. Right. But he's like, we'd rather give you the functionality you know, that's baked into them now and get around to upgrading the databases later. Another theme that came up, and he actually referenced the conversation with Michael Dell from yesterday's keynote, yeah. about um, kind of the evolution of, of compute horsepower. And you know, you had CPUs, and CPUs kind of topped out, then you have you know, multi-core CPUs, now we have GPUs that he said you can put tens or hundreds of thousands on a board at one time. And basically, you know, he's a smart guy, he's down the road a few steps from you know, delivering today's product, saying that you know, we're basically living in an era of unlimited free compute and you know, kind of asymptotically approaching, but that's where we are. And how does that really change the way that we look now at new application development? I thought that was a pretty interesting thing. Yeah, and, and um, sort of big advances in, in um, software architecture come from when you have a big change in the relative cost of compute, memory, network, storage. And so, as you were saying, cost of compute you know, is approaching zero, but at the same time, the cost of memory relative to you know, uh, storage is coming way down. So not only do you have these really beefy um, clusters with lots of compute, but you also have lots of memory. And so he was talking about um, something like putting 16 terabytes of memory you know, in a, in a server and putting 64 servers in a cluster, and all of a sudden, I can't do that math, being that I was a humanities major, but uh, all, all of a sudden, you're talking about huge, you know, databases where you can crunch through this stuff very, very fast because it's all, you know, you have lots of processors running in parallel and you have lots of memory. And it's pretty interesting, he made an interesting statement, he used a sailor reference, he said, you know, we are through uh, the big waves and now we're in the smooth water and, and really saying that, you know, all this kind of heavy lifting and now that this cloud architecture is here and we have this phenomenal yeah. compute and store technology that he can kind of take a breath and really kind of refresh a look out into the future as to how do we build modern apps that have intelligence with basically unlimited resources and how does that change the way that we go forward. I thought that was an interesting uh, point of view, especially because he, he, you know, he has been at it for decades. You know, I, I think he, he was probably looking back to some of the arrows he had in his back from having done um, an in-memory database essentially before anyone else did for, for uh, mission critical apps. And what I think when he's saying we're out of the choppy water and into the smooth water, because we now have the hardware that lets us run, you know, uh, essentially these very resource intensive databases and the apps on them, so that we no longer have to worry, are we overtaxing the infrastructure? Is it too expensive, you know, to outfit the, the hardware for a customer? Right. And so his, when he talks about um, rethinking the apps, he's like, okay, so, we don't have to have separate analytical systems from the transaction systems, and not only that, we can simplify because we don't, um, we don't have to have what he's calling aggregates. In other words, we don't have to, um, we don't sort of, let's say, take an, an order and all the line items in an order and then pre-aggregate sort of all the orders. It's like, we do that on the fly, and that simplifies things a lot, and then, not only that, because we have all this memory, we can do like machine learning um, 
very inexpensively. So a, a, a whole nother chapter in his keynote was about um, kind of modern software design. And a lot of really interesting things, especially in the context of SAP, which was a big monolithic application, hard to learn, hard to understand, hard to manage. I remember a startup that we were at and we were using as a core you know, B2C e-commerce engine, and you know, to add you know, 16 colors of shirts times you know, 10 neck sizes and 10 sleeve sizes was just a nightmare. Yeah. Uh, and you, you're not going to ask some merchant that works at Macy's to, to, to put that into the system. So, but he talked about you know, intelligent design, which is pretty interesting. We're hearing that more and more, you know, a lot of work done over at Stanford, on intelligent design. He's talking about no manuals. He's like, if I can't figure it out, you know, I, I, need to, I need to understand it. He talked about intelligent applications that continue to learn as the applications get more data. And specifically, you know, the fact that machines don't get bored testing you know, hundreds or thousands of even millions of scenarios and grinding through those things to get the intelligence to start to learn about what's going on. So a very different kind of an application, both development delivery approach than kind of what we think of historically as, as, as R3. Yeah, like um, the design thinking was, um, they have this uh, new UI um, called F Fiori. Um, and it, I mean, if you go back 10, 15 years, let's say when they started, um, 15 years when they started trying to put um, browser-based user interfaces on what was a client server system, they had tens and tens of thousands of forms-based screens. And they had to convert them one by one to work in a browser, and I think what he's saying now is they can mock up these prototypes in a simple you know, tool, and they can essentially recreate the UI. It's not going to be the exact you know, sort of same forms, but they can recreate the UI to the entire system so that it's, it's much more accessible. Um, on the machine learning um, front, he was talking about, um, one example was like, uh, matching up um, invoices uh, that you're going to have to uh, pay and so that you're going to train the system with you know all these invoices it learns how to you know essentially do the the um, OCR you know the recognize the text and it gets smarter to the point where um, it can do 95 percent of it without you know human interaction yeah human or you know, it's interesting, when we were at ServiceNow last week as well, and they are using AI to do relatively mundane tasks, right, that yeah. people don't want to do, that machines are good at. Things like categorization and, and assignment and things that are relatively straightforward processes but very time consuming. And again, you know, if you can get to a 70% solution, 80% solution, 90% solution to free people up to do other things on the stuff that's relatively routine, right? If the invoice right. matches the anticipated bill in the system, pay it, you know, right. does somebody really have to look at it? Uh, so I thought that was really interesting. Something I want to dig in with you, he talked a lot about data, where the data lives, data gravity, and he even said that he fought against data warehousing in the 90s and lost. Um, a lot of real passionate conversation about where is data and how should apps interact with data, and he's really against like this data replication in a data lake and moving the stuff all around, but having it you know kind of central. I want to just get your thoughts on kind of that history. What do you think he means now, and where's that going? Uh, that's a great question, and 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 there's a lot of history behind that. Um, not everyone would re would remember, but there was an article in Fortune magazine in the late '90s where uh, it de described him getting up in, in a, uh, a small conference of uh, software CEOs, enterprise software CEOs, and he said basically, we're going to grind you into dust because everything comes in our system integrated, and if you leave it up to the customer to try and stitch all this stuff together, it's going to be a nightmare. And that was back when everyone was thinking, you know, one company can't do it all. And um, the reality was uh, that was the point in time where we really had given, uh, a, you know, go, a pass go, collect $200 to every best of breed little software vendor. And it did prove out over, you know, the next decade that the fewer integration points there were, 
that it meant much lower cost of ownership for the customer, and not only lower cost of ownership, but uh, better business process integration, because you had the end-to-end -end integration. I bring this up because, um, well, actually, I was there when he said it. <laughs> and, um, but I bring it up because he's, he's essentially saying the same thing now, which is, we'll put all the machine learning technology, you know, the building blocks in um, SAP, and if you need any, you know, uh, sort of contextual data, bring it, you know, bring it into our system. You don't want to take our data out and put it into all these other machine learning programs because there's security issues. There's, you know, again the the breakdown in the business process integration. Um, he did acknowledge that with data warehouses, if you have, you know, hundreds of other sources, yes, you're going to need an external data warehouse. Um, but I, I think that he's going to find with machine learning the, the greatest value with the data that you use in machine learning is when you're always adding richer and richer contextual data. And that contextual data means they're getting it from other sources. Right, right. And I don't think he's going to win this battle in terms of keeping most of it within, within SAP. So it, it kind of brings up this other kind of intersection that he talked about. Um, you know, in now delivering SAP as a cloud application, he said now we have to learn how to run our application, not our customers. A very different way of looking at the world. Um, the other thing that piggybacks off of what you just said is we've seen this trend towards configuration, not customization, right? And it used to be probably, you know, back in the days, if you had the big SIs, they love con customization because it's a huge project, multi-years. I used to talk to yeah. one of our central partners, like how do you manage a multi-year SAP project when most of the people that started it probably aren't even there when the day you the day you finish it. But, but he had a specific quote I wanted to call out yeah. now. That what you just said is that he said, only our customers have the data the desire and the domain knowledge to make the most out of it. So it's a really interesting recognition that yes, you want customers to have this configuration option, but we keep hearing more and more, it's config, not customization, customization. for upgrades and all these other things, which now when you go to a cloud-based application, that becomes significant. You you don't want customizations, because that just complicates fact, everything. You you can't, and, and I, I don't know if he said this today, I, I guess he must have said it today, but basically, when you're in the cloud, the the I, I forgot the terminology for for the different instances, but when you're in like the SAP cloud, you can only configure. There's essentially a set of greater constraints on you. When you go to the other end of the spectrum, let's say you run it in your own data center, you can customize it, but when you're running it, essentially sharing. Um, the sharing is, right? the infrastructure, you know, you're you're constrained. Right, you're much right. more constrained, and and they build it for that environment first. Right. But at the same time, they've got the data, and again, this has come up with other SaaS companies that we've talked to. Yeah. Is hopefully they're out of the box business process covers you know ninety percent of the basics, and I think there's been a realization on the business analyst side that we think we're special, but really most of the time, you know, order to cash is order to cash. So if you got to tweak your own internal process to match best of breed, do it. You're much better off than, than trying to shape that computing system to fill your little corner cases. It's, it's funny that you mention that because what happened in the, in the 90s was that the, uh, by far the biggest influencers in, in the sort of purchase decision and the overall life cycle of the app were the big system integrators. And they could typically collect ten dollars in implementation and, and, and change management um, fees for every dollar of license that went to the software vendors. So they had a huge um, sort of incentive to tell the customer, "Well, you really should customize this around your particular, you know, needs," because they made all the money right. off that. Right. So another huge theme of, again, it was such a great keynote. We watch a lot of keynotes, and I have a very high bar for what I consider a great keynote. This was a great yeah. keynote by a smart guy who knows his stuff and has got history. But another theme was just really about AI. Um, and he talked a little bit, which I thought was great. Nobody talks about the fact that airplanes have been flying themselves for a very long time. 
Um, and so it is coming, and this is, I think he even said maybe this is the age of AI, um, but, you know, there always have to be some humans involved. It's not a complete uh, handover of control, right. but it is coming, and it's coming very, very quickly. I, I actually thought that um, they were a little further behind than um, might be expected for, considering that it's been years now that people sort of in software have seen this coming. Right, right. But they had a, and they, they have um, in the dozens of sort of applications or, or functions right now that are machine learning enabled. But if you look out at their roadmap, you know, where they get to predictive accounting, customer behavior segmentation, um, uh, profile completeness for for uh, in sales, solution recommenders, um, um, model training infrastructure for the the base you know software foundation. They have a a pretty rich roadmap, but um, I guess I would have I would have thought it would be a little farther along. But then Oracle isn't really any farther along. Um, Workday has done some some work for HR. Um, and uh, for whatever reason, I, I think the enterprise application vendors, I think they found this challenging for two reasons. On the technical side, um, machine learning is very different from the traditional analytics they did, which was really essentially OLAP, you know, business intelligence. This, this requires, you know, the, the data scientists and the white lab coats, and instead of backward looking, you know, uh, business intelligence, this forward looking predictive analytics. Right. The other thing is, I think you sell this stuff differently, which is when it was business intelligence, you're, you're basically selling, you know, reporting on what happened to department heads or, or function leaders. Whereas when you're selling um, predictive, uh, predict capabilities it's a little more trans transformative and you're selling you're not selling efficiency which is what these applications have always that's been their value proposition right, right. you're selling you know trans transformational outcomes which is uh, a different sort of selling motion right it's funny I heard a funny quote the other day you know we used to look backwards with a sample of the data <laughs> and now we're in real time with all, all the, the data. data, very different, and and uh, forward looking, and forward looking forward as well looking. with the yeah. with predictive. That's that's a great great quote. Yeah. Um, again, he, he he touched on so on so many things, but one of the things he brought up is Tesla. He owns. He actually said he has two Teslas, or he has a second Tesla. And there was a question and answer afterwards, really about the Tesla not as a technology platform, and he and he, and he poked fun at Germans. He said Germans have problems with simplicity, and he referenced, I presume, a, a Mercedes or a Porsche and all the perfectly ergonomically placed buttons and, yeah. and switches. He goes, you sit in a Tesla, and it just all comes up on the touchscreen. And if you want to do an update overnight, they they update your software, and now yeah. you have the newer version of the car versus the Mercedes, where it takes them three years to redesign the the buttons and switches. I thought that was interesting. And then one of the, the, the Q and A people said, but what about the buying experience? If you know anyone who's ever bought a Tesla, it's a very different experience than buying a car. And how does that really apply to selling software? And it was pretty interesting. You know, he said, we're not there yet, but he has clearly grasped on, it's a new world and it's a new way to interact with the customers, kind of like his, his no manuals uh, comment that, you know, Tesla is defining a new way to buy a car, experience a car, upgrade a car. At Operate the same it, time, yeah. he got the, the crazy mode, fanatical mode, I can never, ludicrous mode, so that he could stomp it and tell the Porsche guys that you're falling behind further every <laughs> single day. So I thought, you know, really interesting, bring that kind of a consumer play and a kind of a cutting edge automotive example into what was historically a pretty stodgy enterprise software space. You know, it's funny, I'm listening to when you're when you're saying that and and that was almost like the day one objective from salesforce which was we want an enterprise app you know like siebel but we want an ebay like or yahoo like you know experience and that did change um the experience for for buying it and and for operating it and um i think you know, that was almost 20 years ago where, where that was Mark Benioff's, you know, objective. And, right. and he's saying, okay, you know, 
it's easier to do that for CRM, but it's now time to bring that to ERP. Right. The other thing he brought in, which I was happy being a Bay Area resident, is the Sharks, um, because he's a part owner of San Jose Sharks. Yeah. Obviously, it's SAP Center now, uh, also known as the Shark Tank, and used to be owned by another uh, technology company. Uh, but he made just a funny thing. I like hockey, so I should like um, SAP, SAP because, yeah. and he was doing, you know, talking about the analysis of how often the logos come up on the right. telecast, et cetera. But it's, the thing that struck me is he said the analysis is actually now faster than the game pretty interesting way to think about this data in flow in that the analysis coming out of the game that feeds Vegas, it feeds you know all these stat lines, it feeds fantasy, it feeds all this stuff, it feeds the, the advertising purchase and the ROI on my logo, is it in the corner, is it on the, on the ice, is it in the middle, is actually moving faster than the hockey game. And hockey's a pretty fast game very different world in which we live, even on the, Mar the MarTech side. And that was, that was an example of one of the um, machine learning type apps, because it, I think in their case they were using, I think Google, Google image recognition technology, you know, to parse out essentially all the logos and see what type of impact your brand made relative to your purchase. Yeah, I mean, I, I could go on and on. I have, I have so many notes. Again, I live tweeted a lot of it. Um, you know, he's just such a humble guy. He's a smart guy. He, he comes at it with a technology background, but you know, he, he, he said we're a little bit slower than we'd like. He talked about some things taking longer than he thought they would, yeah. but he also now sees around the corner that we are very quickly going to be in this age of infinite compute, and we are, very inf we are already in an age of no one's reading manuals. And, and it just seemed very, you know, kind of customer centric. We're no longer the super smart Germans that will do it our way or the highway and, and you will adapt your process to us, but really kind of customer centric point of view, design thinking, talked about sharing their roadmap as far out in advance as possible. I think specifically when he got a question on design thinking, he's like, you know, the studies show that a collaborative uh, effort yields better results. It's no longer we're the smartest guy in the rooms and we're going to do it this way and you're going to adapt. So really progressive. And, and he talked about with Concur, he said their, their UI is so easy that you really don't need a manual. In fact, if you do, you know, you've failed. Right. And I think he what he's, you know, trying to say is we're going to take um, that iterative prototyping capability agile development, you know, and extend it to the rest of the, you know, ERP family and that with their Fiori UI and the tools that build that, that, um, th those screens, right. that it'll make that possible. And even have a little cap, you know, that we don't spend enough investment on design and UI because it is such an important piece of the puzzle. Yeah. But George, we're running out of time here. I want to give you the last word. You've been paying attention to SAP for a very long time. So Hasso's terrific, but then Hasso gets off the stage and he said, I don't run the company anymore. I only make recommendations. As you look at SAP and, you know, Bill McDermott was yesterday, um, are they changing, uh, you know, are, are, are they just stuck in an innovator's dilemma because they just make so much money on, on their historical business or, or are they really changing? What's your, you know, kind of take uh, as they develop where they are now and, and what do you see kind of going forward for SAP? Well, um, it's a really good question and I, I, I would say I look at the value of the business processes that they are either augmenting or Automating, I hesitate to say automate because, as he said, you still want the pilot, you know, <laughs> in the in the cockpit. In proximity to yeah, the yeah, to the right. And and he was like, look, when we do the invoice matching, it's not like we're going to get it 100 percent right. We're going to get it. I think, I think he was saying like in the labs right now, it's like 94 percent right. So we're going to make you more productive. We're not going to eliminate that job. Um, but when you, you know when you're doing invoice matching, that's not a super high value, um, you know, business process. If you're doing something where you're um, predicting churn and making a next best, you know, offer to a customer, that's a higher value uh, process. Or if you have a multi-touch point commerce, you know, solution where you can track the customer, you know, whether it's mobile, whether it's uh, whether he's coming by a chat, whether he's in a store, um, and you're able to, you know, see his history or her history, 
and you know what's most appropriate given their context at any one moment, that's higher value. Um, and then it's super high value to be able to take that back upstream towards, okay, here's where the inventory is. I have some in this store. I can't fulfill that clothing item directly from the store, but I can fulfill it from this one. Or, um, you know, I have it in another warehouse. Um, when you have that level of sort of awareness and integration, that's high value. Yeah, but I want to push back a little bit on you, George, because I do think the invoice, match. if he can automatically match 94% of the invoices, that is tremendous value because that, that it, it, I, I just think it's so creative when you apply this machine learning to tasks that feel relatively mundane, but if you're speeding your cash flow along, if you get 94% of your invoices done one day faster and you're a multi-million dollar business, what is the dollar, the direct dollar impact to the bottom line, like immediately, it's huge. And then you can iterate and move into other processes. I just, I think the, what's termed a low value transaction is actually a lot higher value than people give a credit. It's just like, again, another one we hear about all the time, automation of password reset. Some of these service desks, password reset, I heard a stat and one of them was like 70% of the calls are password reset. So if you can automate password reset, sounds kind of silly and mundane. Oh my gosh, it's like 70% of your calls. It's humongous. I, I hear what you're saying. Let me, let me give you an, an, another counter example, which was, um, and he, I think he brought this up, I don't know if it was today or when Dell, uh, Michael Dell spoke, which was the Dell's revolution wasn't that they were more efficient than doing what Compaq did, it's that they had a different business model, which was specifically they got paid before they even procured or, or, or right. assembled the components. Or and paid that, for them, right? So yes, they had no, they had no yes. inventory carry So costs. in fact, that meant that meant they their working <laughs> capital, their their working capital needs like were negative. Right. In fact, the bigger they got, the more money they collected. Right. Up before front. they, you know, before they had to spend it, and that's that's a different business model. That wasn't automating the, you know, the invoice matching. That was, you know, we have such good systems that we don't even have to um, pay for them and then assemble the stuff until after the customer gave us their credit card. Right, right, right. And, and um, I think those are the things that, you know, new, new types of applications can make possible. Right, well, we, you know, we see it time and time again. It's all about scale. It's all about finding inefficiencies. Uh, and, and there's a lot more inefficiencies around than people give credit as Uber showed with a lot of cars that sit in driveways and uh, Amazon and the public clouds are showing with a lot of inefficient you know, not used uh, utilization in private data centers. So uh, the themes go on and on and they're, pr they're pretty universal. So exciting keynote. Yeah. Uh, any last comment before we sign off on uh, for today? Um, I guess we want to take a close look at Oracle next um, and see how, f how their roadmap looks like in terms of applying, you know, th these new technologies, IOT, machine learning, blockchain, because you know, all of these can remake how you build a business. Yeah. All right, well, that's George Gilbert from Wikibon. I'm Jeff Frick from theCUBE. We are covering uh, ongoing S uh, coverage of SAP Sapphire 2017. Thanks for watching. We'll be back with more after this short break. Thanks.